From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power with David Weston. From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our television audience worldwide, this is Balance of Power. It's budget day in Washington, even in Philadelphia, as it turns out, as we're going to get the president's budget later today, although we already are getting some sense of what's in it, to take us through it. And by the way, how much should we be paying attention to it? Welcome now, Washington correspondent Joe Matthew. He's host of Sound On weekdays at 1 p.m. Eastern time on Bloomberg Radio. Joe, thanks so much. We are getting some headlines out here. It's hard to parse through them, at least for me to parse through them. But give us the significance of this budget. Yeah, look, we could call this the Build Back Better budget uh, based on what I've seen here, David, because it does include a number of big ideas that were baked into the Build Back Better plan, the social spending plan that the president was not able to get across the finish line last year. Now, as you mentioned, this is literally being released as we speak at this moment, and the president will speak to it later on today. A couple of headlines I want to get off right off the top. A $6.9 trillion budget, that's the top line, would increase discretionary spending by 5%, defense spending by 3%, remembering that House Republicans wanted a defense spending cut here, non-defense spending up by more than 7% to $688 billion. It would hike taxes by more than $5 trillion, and that's important here. Here's how it would work. A 25% tax on billionaires, David, a near doubling of the capital gains tax, a hike in the corporate tax rate back to 28%, and a higher personal income tax rate of 39.6% for people making over $400,000 a year. The president says those making less will not see tax hikes. It would essentially then undo the Trump tax hikes, uh, cuts rather, from 2017. Also of interest here for the Bloomberg audience, it would eliminate the carried interest tax break, David. We've talked about that a lot of times before. Couldn't get that done last year either. And it would cut a tax break for crypto investors uh, that allows for tax loss harvesting. Uh, tax incentives for fossil fuel companies would also be cut. When you zero out here and look at headlines just now crossing the terminal, this plan, David, would add $17 trillion <laughs> to the deficit over a decade. This is fresh, breaking news now. Again, the president will talk about it in about two and a half hours. Yeah, and you summarized it particularly well. Thank you so much, Joe. Of course, we'll hear from the president speaking in Philadelphia with that budget. But that's Joe Matthew. You want to check him out and sound on on Bloomberg Radio at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Well, one of the big issues pending is the debt ceiling. And it re reads against us because of the deficit and the debt problem that we have. We heard, talked earlier to former Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan. He, he addressed our Bloomberg, he talked about this in, with our Bloomberg colleague, Francine Lacqua over in Paris earlier today. At the end of the day, we're going to really have to get serious about our debt crisis. It's every modern country has this problem, and we can't keep piling on this kind of a debt because we're the world's reserve currency. We're not acting like a reserve currency. And now we turn to somebody who has dealt with these budgets in the past. It's Glenn Hubbard. He's Columbus, Columbia Business School professor and dean emeritus, former chair of the Council of Economic Advisors under President George W. Bush and author most recently of The Wall and the Bridge, Fear and Opportunity in Disruptions Wake. So, Professor, thank you so much for being with us. Really appreciate it. Sure. So I, I don't want to be flip, but it feels a little to me on these initial reports of sort of Oprah saying, you get a car, you get a car, you get a car. It sounds like everybody gets something in this budget. What is the significance of the president's budget? Well, on the one hand, obviously, it's political theater. When the Democrats controlled the entire Congress, essentially the same package couldn't pass. That said, it, it is an opening bid on how to solve the nation's debt problems, as, as former Speaker Ryan uh, was saying. The problem is it's a set of very anti-growth proposals, none of which, either individually or collectively, come close to dealing with the debt problem, which is essentially a spending problem. We can't raise taxes enough to fix uh, our crisis. We would have to cut spending, and that, of course, is the political rub. So, so talk about that debt situation. At what point does a debt problem becomes a debt crisis for the country? Well, to be honest, we don't know. There are no bright lines, particularly for the reserve currency country. What we can say is that it constrains future decisions, so our ability to finance defense, to finance education, to finance research is hemmed in by higher debt and higher interest payments. 
Remember, in the backdrop of this is a monetary policy tightening that's raising interest rates when the Treasury has been shortening the maturity of its debt. So expect that to add to the numbers uh, that we're seeing. So this is a live conversation, particularly with the Medicare trust funds running out of funds this decade and the Social Security trust funds next decade. What about that issue specifically, Glenn? Uh, when it comes to Medicare, for example, one of the proposals we at least have been expecting out of this budget is increasing some of the payroll tax for Medicare on people making a, a higher levels because there is a cap to that. Is that something that you think might be doable in the country that might help Medicare at least? Well, I don't think so. First of all, if we're going to fix Medicare or Social Security for that matter, we need to first start by modernizing the programs before we think about budgets. And then in the context of budget, realize if we want programs this generous, we all have to pay for them. Remember that in European economies with very generous social insurance programs, taxes on everyone are higher through consumption taxes. It's impossible to pay for these programs by taxing the rich. That may be politically interesting, but economically or even arithmetically, there's no there there. Is there any constituency for actually cutting spending right now, Glenn? Well, probably not, because when you say, would you like to cut something, you have to have a counterfactual. So the question is, would we rather change programs, say, to increase their support for the least well-off among us and maybe cut it back a bit for the rest in exchange for other investments we need to make in the economy? I, I think we need our leaders to tell more of a story. When you just say cut, of course, that's never going to be popular. So, Glenn, put this against what we're seeing out of the Federal Reserve. We obviously heard from two, for two days from uh, the Fed chair, Jay Powell. We're about to see uh, jobs numbers tomorrow. Uh, how does the federal budget, whatever ends up being actually, read against the inflation and growth questions? Well, it's interesting because it goes in both directions. The higher future federal deficits in a large economy like the United States will put some upward pressure on interest rates. And going the other direction, I at least believe the Federal Reserve has still quite a bit more work to do. I would see a terminal funds rate closer to 6% than where we are right now. All of that implies that interest payments on the federal debt would rise substantially, really focusing the question in Washington on what do we do about it. As we uh, watch uh, Chair Powell and the other members of the Federal Reserve sort their way through dealing with inflation, one of the key questions has been the, the labor market, of course. Uh, Jay Powell keeps saying that that's one of the key issues. Today, we got numbers out that surprised a little bit on uh, unemployment claims. They're a bit higher than was expected. Are we seeing any indication yet at all of some loosening of that very tight labor market? Well, we are seeing some loosening, but I, I think the labor market's still quite tight. The claims numbers, while they're higher, are way short of what one would typically associate with recession territory. I mean, very, very short of that. So I think the Fed still has a lot of work to do there. To the Fed's credit, no one knows exactly how quickly people who left the labor force for COVID or other reasons might come back. But I think the Fed still has a lot of work to do. And I'd be surprised if tomorrow's employment report points in the uh, opposite direction. So you said that you wouldn't be surprised at a, a terminal rate uh, approaching 6%, something people are talking about at the present time. Let's assume for the moment you're right, they get to 6%, however they get there, 50 basis points, 25 basis points, however they get there. Is that going to be, in your judgment, enough to get us back around the 2% target rate for inflation? I think it could well be, but it may have to be held there for a period of time. Remember, Milton Friedman taught us there are long and variable lags in monetary policy but we're quite a bit above the 2%. And getting inflation back down to, say, 4 was doable through supply uh, fixes and supply chain remedies. Getting it all the way back to 2 in the time frame the Fed has in mind will require a lot of demand destruction, which is just econ speak, for needing to hold the rate there longer. And what does that mean for growth or even loss of growth going into a recession? Well, it, it certainly uh, could lead to a recession, but I think in the long term, what's more important is getting inflation back in line so that inflationary expectations don't become unanchored. That's why I think the Fed is quite reasonably focused now, late, but now, on getting inflation down.
At the same time, Glenn, let's go back to your book, uh, Walls and Bridges. Uh, where, what can we be doing with our budget to even in the face of some of the inflation challenges we have, some of the spending, some of the deficit problems we have, making sure we're spending money so we have longer term growth in the out years, not for this year necessarily, but five, 10 years down the road? Well, there are big things that we can be doing that frankly aren't that costly in the terms of the federal budget, increasing our support for basic research, putting applied research centers around the country and funding things like community colleges around the country with say a federal block grant to really bring up the skills levels of more Americans. We could do all of those things at scale for tiny numbers compared to the budget challenges we're facing in the president's speech. What's the one piece of economic advice you would like somebody, suppose you're in the Oval Office, you get one shot with President Biden say, Mr. President, this is the one thing you need to focus on. What would it be, Glenn? I think a key to our political discourse as far as economics is concerned is to focus more on opportunity. It's hard to talk about trade, about immigration, about Ukraine, about pro-growth policy, uh, policies until we deal with opportunity for more Americans. I wish you would focus there. Okay, Glenn, it's always such a pleasure to have you with us. That's Glenn Hubbard. He's Columbia Business School professor and dean emeritus. Coming up, we'll talk with the president of Georgia about her country's complicated relations with the European Union and with Russia. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We talk a lot about Ukraine right now, as we should, given the war that's going on that Russia is inflicted on. But there's another country over in the facility that's been dealing with Russia for some time to, for now, and that is Georgia. That is caught really in something of a tug and pull between Europe on the one hand and Russia on the other. We welcome now the president of Georgia. She's Salome Zorbichvili. Thank you so much, Madam President, for joining us. Thank you for having me. As I say, it strikes me from a distance your country is in a difficult position, and we've just seen it play out within the last 24 hours. As I understand it, there was a statute that had been proposed called the Foreign Agents Law, very controversial. The Europeans had really uh, condemned it, the United States had. It seemed to be tied to something Russia has done in the past. It's now been rescinded. Tell us where you are on that statute right now and why it's so important. Well, it's very important because we are at a very important uh, place now, waiting for the decision of the European Union on our candidate status, which it awarded to uh, Ukraine and Moldova a few months ago, and we are waiting for a similar decision before the end of the year. Uh, and we have been given a number of recommendations on what to do to deserve this candidate status. We have been given European perspective, which is no less important because it means that uh, all the discussions that were before on our geography, that we maybe were too far, all of that is uh, ended and we are with a European perspective, but we have to deliver. And that's where this law comes completely out of the blue. Uh, and it goes against everything that the European Union recommends us to do, which is to involve more the so civil society, to be more transparent, uh, to allow for more uh, insertion of the civil society in the uh, political discussions about our European future. Uh, so it was taken by the Georgian population as an anti-European law, uh, and it was taken as such by our international partners, all of them. There was a total unanimity of our international partners and total unanimity of the Georgian society, uh, which showed itself on the streets for now, we have the third day. Uh, and uh, I had, as soon as the law was initiated, I uh, declared publicly that I would veto it. Uh, and I've supported the demonstrations mm. that happened in Tbilisi. And finally, uh, the authorities gave in and withdrew, uh, or are withdrawing, announced that they are going to withdraw uh, this law, which still nobody understands why they suddenly decided that it was something uh, useful to do at this stage. Now, that's a battle. Uh, it's not the end uh, right. of this road that we are 
going on to join uh, the European Union to get the mm. candidate status. Mm. So it's a very important time for Georgia. As I understand it, and I don't understand parliamentary politics at all in Georgia, but as I understand it, this proposed law made it pretty far into the process. It looked at one point like it might be adopted. Did the fact that it made it that far, do you think that damaged Georgia's position with the European Union in of itself? Did it damage your status because you came so close? No, I think it, uh, to the contrary, uh, because everybody knows that in the Georgian parliament there is a majority that is the uh, uh, Georgian dream. So anything they propose, they are able to <laughs> go ahead and uh, uh, implement it. So nobody can really oppose it, not even the veto of the president. Uh, but... Uh, what it has demonstrated is that when the society is united uh, on something, they can defeat even the majority that is in the parliament. Uh, and that's what is important. So I don't think that, I think it has increased our chances uh, because it has shown very effectively where does the Georgian population stand, which it has been showing uh, on many occasions until now already that it's pro-European. Uh, all uh, the uh, opinion polls have given 80% in favor of the European Union, uh, and that's where people want to go, want to study. Uh, so it's very clear where the population stands. Do you know what was not clear, so, yeah, sorry. sorry to just finish, what was not clear less and less in the recent times was the position of the authorities. Because they were the ones to introduce in the Constitution the European integration process, the Euro-Atlantic process, to declare that 2024 should be the year uh, where we would uh, announce our candidacy. That was before the Ukrainian war. Uh, and suddenly they take steps that are going in the other direction. So their position is not clear. Georgia's position is very clear. So, so you mentioned it's not clear where this initiative came from. Uh, it's surprising it as far as it did. Do you have any intelligence, do you have any sense of where it did come from? Is it, do you think, Russian influence, either directly or indirectly, because you are close to Russia, and it does echo a similar law that Russia has enacted? Yes, uh, it uh, echoes a Russian law, a Hungarian law. <clears throat> Uh, why the authorities, the governmental authorities, mm -hmm. or the parliamentary, but they are one and the same, uh, why uh, did they think that uh, they wanted to go in that direction is something that one would have to ask them. I have no clue. Uh, I have said and repeated that I thought that it was going in the opposite direction, that it was not uh, European, pro-European law. I have said early on that I would veto and oppose uh, any uh, law in this period that would go against the recommendations presented by the uh, European Union. Uh, and I did veto uh, a law on listening devices that was also going in the wrong direction. Uh, so that's where we have, and we cannot second guess why political uh, uh, leaders uh, take certain decisions, whether it's for mm. electoral, aims in the future, mm -hmm. uh, whether they have some connections with, uh, with Russia, whether they think that Russia is an easier <laughs> <laughs> partner when you're less democratic than mm. European Union, that's for you to guess and me to find out. <laughs> uh, Madam President, you, I believe, have said in the past that you're concerned about the influx of Russians into Georgia. Does that remain a concern to you? Again, we're so conscious of this, given what's going on in Ukraine, although it's happened in Georgia. I mean, <laughs> Russians came into yeah. the northern Georgia and took a fair amount of territory. We have a very good experience of what it means. That's why uh, there, too, the Georgian population is in total solidarity with Ukraine. And myself, personally, I've expressed as many times as I could this uh, solidarity because we are in the same boat. And what uh, Ukraine is doing today is fighting for its own sovereignty over its territory, but also for our sovereignty and our territory. Uh, so it's very important that this unity uh, is kept within the country and between uh, Ukraine and, uh, and Georgia. You were mentioning uh, the Russians that have come uh, in Georgia. Most of them have come because they were fearing mobilization or were not in agreement with the way uh, their president is carrying this aggression against uh, Ukraine. Mm -hmm. 
it's difficult to know exactly what were. Uh, so my concern was to say we have uh, to keep a control on the process. We cannot close uh, because that wouldn't be right yeah. and not in conformity with Georgian traditions of hospitality and receiving foreigners. Uh, but uh, we have to control what's happening, who is coming in, uh, how long they're staying, mm -hmm. what kind of jobs they're taking. Uh, all of that, we have a duty to control uh, for our population so that our population knows that there is uh, their government is taking care of this situation, not getting out of hand. Mm -hmm. So we have not had uh, over this past year any uh, incident between uh, neither Georgians and Russians, nor, I must say, between uh, Ukrainians, because mm. we also have uh, Ukrainian right. refugees uh, and Russians. So we keep, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, but we have to, to know what's yeah. happening. It cannot be just let on its own inertia. Right. Well, best of luck on that. Thank you so much for coming to Bloomberg. Really appreciate it. That is the president of Georgia. She is Salome Zorovachvili. Still to come, we're going to hear from the CEO of Shell on his company's energy future. And we're going to be having a daily segment on Wall Street Week going forward starting Monday at about 2.40 in the afternoon. Steve Ratner will be with us on Monday. And this is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We're in that special period between hearing from Jay Powell, the chair of the Fed, and getting jobs numbers tomorrow. So the question is, what are the markets doing with that special period? And for that, we turn to Abigail Doodle. So where are we? That's a good characterization, <laughs> special period between uh, the Fed and the all-important jobs report and next week, the CPI. So right now, we're super jittery. Earlier, the S&P 500 had been up a half a percent. Now we're up ever so slightly. We had moments ago been down a little bit. The Nasdaq is a little bit higher than Nasdaq 100 up four tenths of one percent. We have yields down in a big way today. So a little bit of a repricing of on the part of bonds, because on Tuesday, the markets perceive Fed Chair Jay Powell to be super, super hawkish yesterday uh, that he walked it back a little bit. That's something that a lot of these Fed chairs uh, tend to do in terms of two days of testimony so that markets can meet in the middle. Uh, but that's giving uh, valuation on tech stocks a little bit of a break. What are they ready for? As best you can tell, I mean, a couple of questions there. Last time I checked, the chances of a 50 basis point hike was something getting close to 50-50, where it had been much less. Yes. And now we hear increasingly people talking about 6% as terminal rate. We just had Glenn Hubbard from Columbia Business School on. He said 6%. Well, Are they ready for 6%? Are they ready for 50 basis points? I think I, This is what I love about FedSpeak, because they've been floating 6%. If you recall, Jamie Dimon floated the idea yeah. of 6% last year. So these numbers sort of folks, traders get acclimated to the idea that it could go that much higher. In terms of what markets are actually pricing in, the last time I looked, it was almost a 50-50 a chance, and I'm putting in warp right now into the Bloomberg terminal, on, in terms of um, 50 basis points for the March meeting. I think the big deal is 5.63% in September. Right now, that's considered to be the peak. So it's below that 6%. You know, but Fed Chair Jay Powell, it's data dependent. So we have to see where all of these data prints come in, and not just for one month, but month after month after month. Abigail, thank you so very much. That was terrific. That's Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle. Coming up, Big Oil making the energy transition. This is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television. I'm David Weston. To keep you up to date with news from all around the world, we turn now to Lisa Mateo, who is here with the first word. Lisa. Thank you, David. Well, in Ukraine, Russia launched a devastating barrage against cities today. At least five people were killed. Hundreds of thousands more plunged into blackouts. The Russians were said to use a new mix of weapons that mostly evaded air defenses. In Israel, tens of thousands of people headed for protests over the government's plan to cut the power of the Supreme Court. There may be demonstrations in 20 cities. Protesters are calling it a day of resistance to dictatorship. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his allies say they're trying to rein in a court that has overstepped its authority. Is the COVID pandemic over? Well, that answer to that question is revealing another divide for Americans. The latest Gallup poll shows it's basically 50-50 whether Americans think the pandemic is behind us. 51% say they don't think it is. 49% said they do. The Washington Times reports that's a new high since Gallup started asking the question nearly two years ago as many states began to lift their restrictions. 
And Californians are bracing for more severe weather. Heavy rains and damaging winds will sweep across most of the state today and tomorrow as a powerful Pacific storm brings another round of floods and mudslides, as well as snow on some of the state's highest peaks. Flood watches, wind advisory, storm, winter storm warnings blanket most of California and its neighbors. Some areas could see as much as 15 inches of rain. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. David. Thank you so much, Lisa. As I said the last segment, we're waiting between the Jay Powell testimony up on Capitol Hill that we had on Tuesday and Wednesday and the big jobs numbers coming out tomorrow to really give us a preview of those jobs numbers and how they might affect the Federal Reserve. We turn now to Michael McKee. He's Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Correspondent. Mike, thanks so much for being with us. What do we expect? What's consensus on the jobs for tomorrow? Well, consensus is we go back to the pattern that we were in, to the trend that we had before the January numbers. The consensus forecast is 225,000 jobs. The last month it was 517,000, you'll remember, and that basically changed everyone's mind on Wall Street and turned thinking about the Fed upside down. Everybody thought they were sort of on a glide path to maybe being done with raising interest rates, and then we got that huge jobs number followed by a strong CPI number, and everybody then started pricing in extra rate moves, and now they're talking about the possibility of another half percentage point move on March 22nd. So tomorrow does have a lot of import. If we go back to where we were, the pressure is still on probably to do more. Uh, we'll see what happens when we get the CPI numbers. But if we do drop below consensus, maybe into the 100,000s, then we could see the Fed back off a little bit and not be quite as aggressive sounding at their next meeting. Uh, Mike, are we seeing any little indications of any loosening of the job market elsewhere? I mean, certainly we've got the jobless claims numbers out today. The surprise, they were higher than people expected them to be, I think by 21,000 or so. And there was also a Bloomberg New Economy report, as I recall this morning, about the construction industry, that maybe it's not quite as tight as it was. Are we seeing some glimmer with respect to labor? Uh, yeah, you could call them maybe green shoots. That's appropriate since it's almost spring, but we're not <laughs> quite there yet. Uh, we did see in the uh, jolts numbers that came out yesterday, everybody watching for those, uh, big decline, the biggest ever really in job openings for construction workers. And people have been wondering why that's been so strong, even though the Fed's raised interest rates so much, mortgage rates have gone up and activities really dropped off. Builders have been working through backlogs, but maybe now they're going to start cutting workers. We'll see tomorrow if that's the case. Unfortunately, the jobless claims numbers come with a big asterisk when New York schools go on vacation, which they did last week at spring break. New York education employees can file for unemployment benefits. And so for a week, they get uh, a check and it pushes up those numbers uh, this time uh, by 16,000. And if you subtract those 16,000 from what we got, you're back to 195, still the same old numbers in terms of jobless claims. So the evidence that the economy and, and hiring is slowing is still very slim. So, so Mike, none of us begrudge uh, somebody getting a job, for goodness sakes. That's a, that's a good thing, all the things we do. But if you're fighting inflation, even more important than whether people are employed is how much they're getting paid. What are we seeing in terms of wage increases and what do you think we may expect tomorrow? Wage increases have been relatively small. They've slowed down a little bit, but not very much. And the, uh, the latest Beige book yesterday said that in many districts, uh, Fed districts, uh, companies are seeing uh, the demands for higher wages slow down some, but they're still elevated. And they still have a ways to go to get down to what the Fed would think is a sustainable level. But you put your finger on the big political issue up on Capitol Hill the last two days, with Jay Powell, a lot of members of Congress arguing that uh, the Fed is sacrificing the American worker in order to bring down inflation, because if uh, unemployment goes up by a percentage point, as the Fed forecasts, that's about a million and a half, two million jobs. Uh, Powell doesn't have a lot to say about it. It's his job to bring down inflation, but it is a kind of a flashpoint right now. Mike, you spent a good part of your career covering the Federal Reserve, and we're the better for it. We now have a name that is sort of being floated right now to replace Lael Brainerd as the vice chair of the Federal Reserve. I'm happy to say that she is from Northwestern University, which is not Michigan, but it is Big Ten, so that says something good for her. <laughs> so what do we know about her, and do you think people are overreacting to the claim that she's sort of a dove? 
Uh, you you only like people who uh, who Michigan can beat, I think, David. <laughs> uh, Janice Everly is an associate dean at Northwestern University. She's been uh, uh, in the economics forefront for quite some time, does a lot of work on labor issues and monetary policy issues, a regular at many forums, including uh, Jackson Hole. She was the chief economist at the Treasury Department, and uh, so she has some familiarity with Washington and, and how things work. Uh, the president is, we understand, looking for somebody who might be on the dovish side, but the trail is, is, is not very long for people who haven't actually been at the Fed in terms of whether they think uh, you want to be hawkish or dovish. She might lean a little more dovish, all things being equal, but as I said right now, it's the Fed's job to bring inflation down. So I don't think it, it really matters too much for the next year or so. They're, uh, they're definitely going to be keeping interest rates high. It'll be after that that matters. Uh, now, she is rated as uh, one of the favorites. Our White House people have been told that she tops the list, but she hasn't met with the president yet. So we're still a little ways away from a decision. <laughs> Mike, thank you so much. Always wonderful to have you with us. That's Bloomberg's Michael McKee. Coming up, Anne-Marie Hordern's interview with the president of Finland. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television. I'm David Weston. A short time ago, Washington correspondent Anne-Marie Hordern talked with the president of Finland, Isauli Nenisto, about his country's move to join NATO and living next to Vladimir Putin's Russia. You just left the White House. President Biden stopped by for this visit. It wasn't on his schedule. What did you two discuss? Well, we have been discussing quite a lot lately and uh, continuing that uh, deals with the Finnish uh, NATO membership, surely, and uh, the geopolitical situation worldwide. What is your advice to President Biden, given that you used to speak to President Putin quite a lot? prior to his invasion of Ukraine? Yeah, I do not believe that uh, President Biden needs my advices, but uh, maybe we have changed uh, experiences. And uh, speci specifically, approximately a year ago, before Russia attacked, uh, I think that President uh, wanted uh, also me to find all the possibilities of uh, maintaining peace. That was not possible. Mm. Yeah, you are known, or dubbed, the Putin whisperer. But the, the last time you spoke to Putin was in May, and you said to him, we are joining NATO. Yeah. Will you ever speak to him again? I have said that I'm uh, totally prepared to speak with him if uh, there's some benefit from that, but uh, at the moment we haven't found out anything such. As you are waiting to be basically checkmarked into NATO, all the documents are in a row, what are you doing behind the scenes to prepare for your border, 135 mile border at Russia, to be a part of the eastern flank? Yeah, you have to keep in mind that uh, unlike many other countries, uh, we in Finland. Uh, uh, after the Cold War ended, still kept on being aware that something might someday happen. That means that, uh, for example, we maintain conscription, which means that we have 300,000 trained uh, reserves, which is more than uh, a lot bigger countries in Europe. We have, well, purchased uh, F-35s, quite a amount before the attack. So <clears throat> we have always been pre prepared to protect our borders. And uh, joining NATO uh, surely gives, uh, in my thinking, more uh, coverage uh, that nothing will happen. Mm. Uh, but uh, you know, if something happens, we are prepared to take our share and to keeping the borderline. So this is an advancement of your defense of this in-case scenario. 
In December of 2021, Putin demanded that NATO ratchet back this territory on the eastern flank that was basically built up over a quarter century. Then he demanded that there would be no expansion as well. He, you came out and you said he's trying to create this sphere of influence around yes. Russia. That was a game changer in our eyes, because so far we had always thought and said that from our own will we remain militarily uh, underlined. But um, who believes it after Putin says that, well, you can't join. So that was a real game changer if he is thinking. But do you think he considers Swin- uh, Sweden and Finland part of his sphere of influence? Uh, When he said that he demands that NATO doesn't uh, enlarge anymore, practically it means that he wanted a NATO-free zone in front of Russia. I also want to ask you, because you just came off this meeting with President Biden, there obviously is an election in the United States next year. Former President Trump is in that election. He wants to be back at the White House, and he in the past has criticized NATO. Are you concerned about a change of power dynamics here in Washington, especially before this is signed on the dotted line, done deal of your ascension into the military alignment? Well, I I think uh, our our application will be fully ratified. Uh, before, long before your new elections. Uh, we have to keep in mind that uh, uh, as President uh, Trump uh, often said uh, things about NATO, uh, pointing out especially, like many of his predecessors, that uh, Europe has to uh, take its part, that is, that 2%. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is... Uh, Uh, what we have experienced so far from him. You're also going to be speaking to politicians. How concerned are you about the U.S. potentially wanting to claw back or hamper down some of that aid they're sending to Ukraine? What has now happened uh, uh, in Ukraine and uh, in our minds, in Western minds, is that we are more united over Atlantic than ever before, I would say. And I I see no ways to to somehow uh, end up to some kind of different... Did you see the recent reporting that potentially it was Ukrainian group that was responsible for the Nord Stream sabotage? Do you think an act like that will make it more difficult for some Western nations to provide aid to Kyiv? I... I, I don't know, and I do not believe that anybody knows the real truth. Let's wait... Uh, because it was in investigations like allies Swe- economic Sweden, exclusion Swedes zones. are doing all the time in investigations. So let's see where they end up. I also want to ask you, in the face of this conflict, China has not come out and condemned it. And we actually see Xi Jinping will be making a visit to Moscow. What are the concerns that you're seeing in terms of China crossing this line and providing lethal weapons or aid to Moscow? Uh, First of all, China wants uh, to have connection to Europe. It's an important market for them. And um, I would say that uh, it would be wise for China to understand that uh, ordinary people in Europe, in free world, have an opinion. And if China uh, is uh, seen as a supporter of Russia, that would have a huge impact on people's mind and in free world. What people think, it reflects also to policies. Mm. So uh, Chinese image, in a way, is also at stake here. That was Finland President Sauli Ninisto speaking just a short time ago to Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern. And Anne-Marie herself joins us now. So terrific to have that interview, Anne-Marie. Thank you so much for bringing it to us. I guess it was pick up where you started, which is that the president had just left President Biden in the White House. Do we have a sense of what the United States wants from Finland and, by the way, what Finland wants or needs from the United States? 
Yeah, this wasn't on President Biden's schedule. He stopped by a meeting uh, President Ninisto was having with National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. For the United States, Finland has been such a partner, really, David, on two fronts. One, uh, what you just heard from Sally Ninisto is that President Biden had called him and wanted him to kind of see take the temperature almost of Putin while he was building up those troops and seeing if they can avoid this conflict. And now, really, Finland has become so important to President Biden's foreign policy. It's not just about the fact that President Biden can go out and say, under my watch, NATO has been intact. He's now saying NATO has expanded with Finland and, of course, as well as the ascension of Sweden. So, so Amory, I'm curious. We, we heard the president there being quite confident that, in fact, uh, he will be able to join NATO and it won't be that far away that he'll join NATO. What will change as a practical matter? I mean, will there be deployment of troops up there by NATO? Will there be deployment of, of various uh, military assets there? Or is it more of that Article 5? I think big picture, it's about that Article 5. And President Inisto is really talking about that. This was a defense mechanism for them once Putin invaded Ukraine of why they wanted to do this. You know, there's many Finns that have wanted to join NATO. They remember the USSR in the 1940s in Finland. But about a year ago, or a year from the start of, of the conflict in Ukraine, only 20 percent thought this would be a good idea. But then once Putin started rolling tanks in Ukraine, those opinion polls in Finland shot up to 80 percent. So it's really this defense mechanism as well for people's mindsets. But Finland already continued guarding that 830-mile border they have with Russia. How they integrate with NATO, I think, will happen, David, once it is finally done. The paperwork is in line, but they're ne technically not part of the alliance just yet. Yeah, more than a little irony there that if Russia was trying to expand its sphere of influence with respect to Finland, it might have actually reduced its real influence over Finland. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. That was really terrific to have that interview. That's Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern. Coming up, the disturbing economics of guardianship in America. We'll get a report from Ronnie Green of Bloomberg Law. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Guardianship, that's when courts around the country will appoint an individual to act for you when they've decided that you aren't capable of acting for yourself because of age or infirmity or mental difficulties. At the same time, it appears that there's a lot of guardians and not necessarily distributed as they should be across the country. Ronnie Green from Bloomberg Laws looked into it in an extended uh, investigation. He comes now with his results. So, Ronnie, this was pretty shocking, actually, what you found, at least in some places. And I should hasten to say, it's not universal, as I understand it, but there are some instances that are quite egregious. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. What's really striking about the role of adult guardianships, it's really, on one hand, people who are under adult guardianships, younger adults with disabilities or older adults in the last years of their lives, ultimately their rights are really severely restricted and in many ways taken away. You lose the right to make your own decisions, to marry, to enter contracts, and even to make day-to-day -day decisions. And many people I talked with who have been in the system feel like they became invisible. So you have, on one hand, very restricted rights. On the other hand, you have a system in which there's very little accountability, very little scrutiny. The rules are different from state to state. There's no government agency even counting how many times guardians abuse those they are supposed to protect. And you have, I think, between the two, between the rights taken away over here and the lack of accountability over here, you have a great potential for abuse. And we found many cases where the system is abused because many times no one really is watching. And that might be true regardless of the economics. But one of the things I learned from your piece is, at least in some states, the economics actually drive us in the direction of guardians having way too many people to be responsible for. Yeah, that can definitely happen in one state that we looked at um, where guardians in certain cases get paid a total of $35 a month. We spoke with one guardian who has an active caseload of more than 200 and said she basically has to have this caseload to make it work. So, and of course, that can be different elsewhere in other guardian ship cases maybe where those rules are not in place, lawyers and guardians can charge up to hundreds of dollars an hour. So that goes to sort of one of the larger issues here is there's really no uniformity. Different states have different rules, and it sort of can be the Wild West if, if you're not looking, really, at what's happening in these systems. And at the end of each one of these cases, of course, is an adult, a young adult, an older adult, 
who has lost his or her rights and really the ability to speak for themselves. Very quickly, Ronnie, if I could, you're a reporter, you're not a policymaker. Do you have any sense of what could be done about this? Yeah, actually, we have a five-part series, and part five tomorrow looks at actually a tangible reform that's happening in Nevada, which was implemented after serious fraud in Nevada. What happened there is now in Nevada, anytime someone, whether it's a lawyer, a family member, a guardian, petitions to put someone else right. under a guardianship, the right. um, courts there require that a lawyer yep. step in and represent Ron the protected person. Ronnie, thank you so very much. That's Bloomberg's Ronnie Green, and this is Bloomberg.